James O'Toole, it's actually born of Salt Hill, but at two years of age, my parents had the good wisdom to move into the West Henry Street. They bought this shop, it was floods in the 50s, and my mother and father bought it, renamed it Henry Street Stores, and it still exists in as a building since then, and a business, there's a local business next door, Mary Sherry, bring it lady for here, and I work out here as well. So we're, we're 70, what's, what's that, 55? Yeah, 70 years practically here. It's a great neighbourhood. Uh, to be honest, there was five shops in the street when I grew up. There was Dunnigan's up in the corner, there was Thornton's down here, Lines across the road, Michael O'Connor's up the back in ourselves. So there was five shops in a small street. There's no shops left here anymore. Supermarkets are taking over, taking away the personality of what we call the small shop. It was great fun. Uh, it was a great neighbourhood. Uh, there was a lot of mix of different people in the neighbourhood. Support was very important in the neighbourhood. Uh, my mother and father in the shop was open from... The only time they'd go off was three to four hours on Sunday afternoon to go for a spin in the car. The rest of the week was, I was delivering briquettes, or he was in college, or he was in school, etc., etc. It was a great upbringing, great neighbourhood, a lot of great people in this place. Okay, I went to the Jesuits across the road there, Jesuit College. Uh, tolerance, curiosity, um, no problem with Jesuit education. They went to college, University College Gold was called then. Uh, Queen's University Gold was the first college we had in Gold after Queen Victoria back in probably 1812, sorry, 19, 1812, sorry, 1812, 1812. It was then preceded after the Civil War by UCG, was University College Goa, which lasted up to 96, 97. And then Brandon, they decided to name it NUIG. That didn't be too successful. So they invested in a thing called UOG, University of Goa. It's probably one of the only education establishments in the world that went from being a brilliant name at QUG to UOG UG. They won't like this. I know that I'm still involved with the soccer up there. I don't agree with the Brandon lads. We've lost basic inheritance of what a university college goal was. Corporal punishment, was that, that was? Yeah, but different schools, different ways. The cane would be down, and it's called the Bish, would be the rivals of what we call the Jesuits. They use a leather strap like that. No, they wouldn't, they're not going to kill you. You got Shea Bully, they call us, that's Irish. Six slaps, three and three. The cane was more prevalent down in the, in the uh, Patricia Brothers, would be the Bish. I'd say that was a bit, bit more hurtful, but thanks for the God, I didn't, I didn't uh, suffer that. I had no problem with the flipping strap. What led you to America and, and your time in America and eventual sports medicine? Yeah. Well, I was a teacher here in Ireland after I graduated in college. I was a teacher and there was no jobs. It was very simple. Me and a guy called Sean McNamara, who's now up in the north, doing very well, thankfully. How are you, Sean? Um, we are getting part-time here and there. And the government, in all fairness, gave you a few quid and there was no tax. It was enough to go drinking, but you weren't going anywhere else. It was as simple as that. I had played university soccer for UCG as it was then. And they were going on a trip to the States, so invited me and a good friend of mine, Michael Nolan, to go over as guest players. We went over, we had a great time in St. Louis, great time in New York. I had a friend called Fergus too, who was in college with me, I went up to see him in Boston. Of course, we had one or two drinks, and of course, the fucking plane left uh, New York and left me behind. That wasn't their fault. I said, Jesus, what are we going to do? So that was uh, 81, 82. So I stayed in Boston. Uh, Winter came in, there was very little work there. It was kind of tough. I was working as a security guard in the hospital. And then the spring came, so I started getting to the building sites, work with the Irish, etc., etc. We're all illegal. Cops didn't care, they laughed at us. Things have changed dramatically, you know. Nobody, you can't be illegal there anymore. Um, so, and after that, I was played a bit of semi pro soccer. The, the guy that was over my team, a guy called Neil Roberts in Boston University, hurt my ankle. He brought me to BU to the sports medicine unit. I was blown away by it. What I'd seen before that was just sponge and water. League of Ireland, sponge and water. We, we, that is not our fault. Back in those days, we had no sports medicine. I just need, what is this? How do I do this? And that was my first chance. Started off, got into Northeastern University initially. Uh, two years later, when I was a bit older, went back to college. I was 27, 28, so I was in a class with first years. They used to call me Rodney Dangerfield. There was a movie about an old guy that went back to college. And it was a very big hit at the same time. I happened to go back to college about that same time. So I was the Rodney of the class. So. I, I took it, just laughed with them, enjoyed it. And then I managed to get an interview in Harvard. I went over to Harvard, and luckily enough, I passed that interview, and then I spent Harvard, I think it was about 85 January, until I came back, to, or came back from America in 91 at the invitation of a gentleman called Tony O'Neill in Dublin. And Tony O'Neill was my manager in their students' team, soccer. And he said, what are you at? So I told him I was at, he said, just I gotta go over, have a look. So he came over to us a few months later. I organized meetings for him in Boston University, Boston College and Harvard, place I was involved with myself. He came back and says, we're going to set this up in, in Ireland. Would you like to come back? I talked to my boss at Bill um, in, in, in Harvard. I said, sabbatical year coming up. Can I go to Ireland? He says, of course you can. Bill Cockett, off you go. We'll see you next year. I came back and worked at UC. I'd left a place. Harvard had about six and a half to 7,000 students. And we had eight or nine staff working medically. And we, 
we had MRIs in situ. We could take an MRI right there. You know, when I came back to Tyre, it took me six weeks to get an MRI, but it doesn't matter. So I came back to Tony, started, I worked, worked at UC. It was going to be one year, I started working with Tony, and all of a sudden I went from a staff of seven to nine with little students to a college of about 30,000, 40,000 students. With one doctor, he was missing the whole time. He was a great guy, but he was the FBI general secretary. He was across Europe. I was there by myself with thousands of students. It was absolutely made, but it was a brilliant learning experience. And met a lady, these things happen. And then all of a sudden, I decided to went back around to Harvard, I went back for another year. And of course, I only went back six years later on holidays. So that's life. You, these, you never know. You know, you're looking for something that never happens. You're sitting down looking for nothing, bang, hit you in the face. That's, that's just the way life is. Sport in college to me is ex it's extremely important. Um, men's salon, men's corporate, so mine, so body. So I think sport, it's very underfunded in this country in the universities. I mean, there has to be funded an awful lot more. I think it's very good for guys to go to college and ladies to have four years of college sport. The friends that they make, the pressure takes off from study. Uh, we have very, very minimal investment in sport in this country at college level. And it's, it's, it's a sinful. If you're listening to me, Hall Martin, it's a sin. It's a song by a, a great group called the Pet Shop Boys. Um, I was very lucky that basically with Tony O'Neill, he funded most of the things that I wanted. He set up a sports friends he knew that was the best in the country. He invested heavily in it. And that now has become a bit more like the norm. We've really brought up our, our levels of sports medicine treatments in this country. I would say the sports surgery clinic in Dublin is on a par with Andy in America at the moment. That would be um, great people up there. Lisa, you won't hear this interview, the, interview, the, the, the lady that runs the whole show, and um, Mr. Ray Moran being the orthopedic surgeon. We are now, I think, on that cusp. America is serious. The amount of money in sport in America is absolutely serious. You're talking millions and millions and millions and millions. American football, the Super Bowl is on a week next Sunday. It's the biggest, biggest game in the world. We can only match up Northern Ireland final with the GA. The GA have done great, great work being done. Very underfunded, very amateur. America is totally professional. How has Galway changed since you were a young fellow? Um, I would say I grew up in a town of eight to 10,000 people. Uh, sea Road is just on the road down here. It was called Sea Road for a reason. The tide came right up there. This is reclaimed property. All these new estates that were built. Uh, so the, the hub of the town really was a city centre surrounded by Boromore, Shantan of the Western Clada. These were the working class neighbourhoods that fed the factories, the CIEs, all the working town workers came from these areas. The town started to expand. As I said, there was 12,000 people. The town was only 86, 88,000 people. It's expanded far too quick. They haven't learned. We built the Rahun flats back in the 70s. They were a disaster. They had to close them down. The same is happening on the far side of the city called Duhishka, where they're putting too many people in with too little. And they wonder why is it exploding? It's simple. So, you know, city council and those in charge have a lot to answer for. Traffic in the city, they call me the traffic road, which I mean the car quite a lot traveling. It takes me an hour and a half to get three miles. It's just not good enough. They've invested like 30 million already in a, a bypass and nothing has happened. I was fortunate to work in London, Dublin, and New York, Boston, and worked in my hour, sorry, down in a place called Clare Road, Friday for a while. I could walk out my door, get on public transport, get to where I was, get back that evening, I could even stay in the bar that night till 12 o'clock and I still get either a bus or a tram or a train or a tube back home. Here, it's not here. People don't drink and drive in cars. Fine, whose fault is that? You can't get around town. You're wasting 30 million on something outside the town that hasn't happened yet. Where is the logic? There's a, thing, there's a guy called Brendan Holland up town, Holland's news agent, great lad. He's pushing, they call the gloose for X amount of years. They're shooting it down. Taxis don't want it, CIE don't want it. The beauty of the glues is it goes right across town from one side to the other. It's non-invasive. It will fit comfortably. It'll cost something like 70 million. By the time they even get to the start of this new bypass, they'll have to spend that. Uh, we're far behind in transport. We're kind of the edge of the flat earth society, I call us, because we don't look that way. We look the other way. That's the Atlantic Ocean, 3,000 miles. And that's what we are. We're looking more that way than this way. And sadly, that way is under pressure as well. Uh, passions and hobbies? Uh, sport obviously is going to be one. Uh, I'm poor. I might be a great poor, but it's something that it kind of invests in me. It kind of occupies me quite a bit. Um, I have three kids. They're a huge passion of mine. Um, it's sport still. It's in my blood. You know, it's, I, I just think there's so much done by sport, so much great things done by sport. It gives a chance for, even if it's individual, no matter what, people are competing, people are staying fit taking a lot of pressure off the health service. 
people are making friends the whole time. Sport is vastly important and we're vastly underfunding it in this country. Well, the town, be, look, okay, it's just my reminiscence of when I grew up here, what it was, what it was like. It's changed drastically in a short space of time. Uh, the characters, you know, if you look at the thing, you'll see certain faces on the book. They're no longer here, a lot of them. That's my brother on the bike outside. Here, that's just there and sports injury clinic there. That would have been my father and me outside <laughs> till when we were young. Now my grandparents there, but we won't worry about them. That's come back quite a long time ago. They came from the country. Down there, that'd be my mother. That my father there. That's me in the middle, and that'd be the Thorntons and Mr. Thornton there. We used to go swimming out in uh, the good old days. That'd be my first cup with here when I was on the forty with Clatter Rangers. And I had a four book coming out in two weeks yesterday. I think it's the sixteenth of February. Don't Charlie Burns. And um, it's nothing more than I had big ears and a big mouth. I love town to hear people talk and I just, I just write down little notes and I try to just build on that. It's a town that I love. I think you've got to go away from some places sometime to really love it because you, if you stay there the whole time, it seems to be the same. I was lucky to be going out here for the guts of 20 years. And when I came back here, I, used, I ain't leaving anymore. I don't care if I've got a, a million a week to work in America. That's it. This is, this is what I am. This is where I am. This is where I'm going to die. Can you remember the last time you, when you were at your truly happiest? I suppose I have twins, they're up on the wall there, these two little gentlemen. <coughs> they're now seven years of age. This little gentleman on the right, Riley, was born at a pound and a half. And for maybe six to nine months, it was a big question mark, would he make it or not? He was literally head here, feet there. That's what that kid was like. And that gave me probably the worst period of my life. Everybody's got bad periods, that's your boredom. So you ride the bad periods and you just, you should realise when you have the good periods, enjoy it, because it's not going to last. There's a kick in the balls coming around the corner, every, but then again we get back up. When he went through what he went through, and it was extremely kind of distressing, but brilliantly in Dublin, Children's Hospital, to put that lad together. He was called Mr. 5% the day he was born. And now he's a young little vagabond running around and healthy as hell. So that to me, he, he survival was huge. I knew the other lad would make it. He was a huge survival to me, and that's, that's thanks to the Irish um, Medical Paediatrics, particularly here in UCGH and up in Dublin in Children's Hospital. So that, you know, that's good. Okay, your marriage day is always a good day. We all get pissed, we all have great fun. Uh, but birth of children, the next generation, is particularly vital. And I'd like these guys to inherit the same type of ambiance and fun and everything that we had in characters and goal that we had. What would be your proudest moment in life? It would be the friendships I've created with other people and then with me at that time. I can pick up a phone now and ring Dublin, Boston, New York, Florida, etc. with friends and say, so can I get a favour of somebody going over? J1 visa, can I get someone for someone to stay? There is that network that you create. You know, I, no disrespect to accountancy. I'd hate to be in an office by myself, just working on figures all day and going home. You know, how are you interacting with people, the real people out in the world? And that's the way we're becoming here. We're kind of... Okay, we had our COVID. A lot of people went into offices at home and haven't gone back to the offices. You know, I mean, we're still humanity. We should be interacting, no matter if it's bad or worse. Only by working together, we make this place better. So that, to me, is huge as personal interrelationships, etc., etc. It doesn't always work out. That's life. You've got to try. We are both human. And to, human, and to be human is to err. And to forgive for what's divine, I think, somebody said. Do you have any regrets? We all have regrets, but look, we've all gone through it for some reason, whether it's financial or matrimonial or whatever it is, it's all part of life. There is, I think, I think the last census in the world is about 9 billion people, best of my knowledge, it's not far off 9 billion people. And it's very funny, there's no two the same. And that to me just kind of encapsulates what humanity is. You're going to get a kick in the bollocks, just get on with it. You're going to have great days. Try and realise their great days, because they don't stay. Bad days come and go, great days come and go. It's your attitude, it's just, hey, it's part of life. Look, you got here. But okay, here, here's a story. My mother and father loved this. Uh, about 16, my dad says, come at me. Every time he said, come at me, I knew it would be trouble. But there were slight incidents in the street or something I said. He brought me out to a bar called the Oslo Hotel. Sunday morning, gave me five quid. I knew I was in trouble. He says, get a drink, I know you're drinking. I says, I'm going to get a lecture about drink. So I got him his whiskey, I had my pint of harp, whatever it was. Uh, he says, um, we only planned for three. Huh? Eamon, Marguerite, Dolores. 
What do you mean we only planned for three? I didn't realise it. So I was a mistake. So be it. Wasn't I lucky to get her? There's a lot of mistakes out there doing great work, you know. And there was a lot more to come, no doubt. <laughs> Even though the condom took that away. We had no condoms back in our days. No wonder we were all, excuse me. Brilliant. Um, Shotgun weddings, they call them. I've got a few friends around this neighbourhood. Look, we were human. The church was down on top of us. There was no condoms. It was an absolute joke, this country, back in the 60s, 70s. No wonder the place was upside down. So those days, if you impregnated, shotgun wedding, you had to get married. And they were never happy. It was totally wrong what the Catholic Church is in this country. But they, they've now been divested and fair juice to gay burden for taking them on back in the day, Bishop Brown, and now making us a lot more, as a, as a society, a lot more humane, to be honest. If, if you could give one piece of advice to a younger James, a smaller James, what would that be? He's up in the wall there. Jamie, that's the other fella. <laughs> Look, you can't tell them anything. You can be there for them. You can do your very best. Them. Like all of us, when they hit that 14, 15, 16, 17, they're going to start experimenting. The one thing I will say, and I said this so strongly, and I told my daughter this, there's no point telling these little kids, my daughter's 23 now, if I even get a whiff that she's on drugs, I'll do her. She's finished with me. None of us can control. Let them drink. They're all going to drink. Some can handle it, some can't. That's it, those that can't will finally find out. With drugs, you don't get a second chance. Uh, there's a huge fentanyl problem in America at the moment. I was over there at Christmas. Uh, I was in Miami, actually, to see old friends of mine in college. And it was very funny, the hotel we stayed in. It was a fine hotel. You looked out the front window. Miami, these cars. Beckham lived about half a mile on the road into the apartments, right? These cars, $300,000 running up and down. You look out the back window of the hotel, and there was a divide. It was called Overton. And that's where the, all the immigrants and the down and outs. And there was a police car, and they were all there, there was cop cars, they were, you know, they were just watching. There was people lying down on the ground, they were smoking dope and done dust. Was, to me, I think the drugs in America are particularly serious, and usually what happens in America, it infiltrates us as well. And to the best of my knowledge, we have a problem starting here on that. I've always been anti-cigarette by life, I always said there were killers, I was right. Big fucking deal, too many people dead now. I killed my daughter if I see her smoking. Um, if you hear a hint that she goes near drugs, she'd be finished. She knows that. That is, to me, the drug problems, though, lucky enough in Ireland, it's not too bad yet. It will get here. There are those people that bring in the ending. They don't care at what cost if it's going to make a profit. And that, to me, is the most frightening thing in the world, the way things are at the moment.